what's happening out there, everybody. And thanks again for joining us here on Expanded Perspectives with me, Cam Hale. And as always, my man, the Corona Kid, Kyle Filio Wilson. How's it going, everybody? Yes, I'm here in Skeleton Studios. Uh, ready to go, man. We have an interesting show for you today. we got yeah. somebody on that we haven't talked to in a while. He's a close friend of ours. Actually, lives not that far from us. He lives in Texas, but he's not from Texas. He's from jolly old England. He'd been in prison for the last eight. No, I'm kidding, folks. He hadn't been in prison. <laughs> yeah, we're going to be talking with Nick Redfern. Um, you know, he's a fantastic author. I don't know. He's written about a thousand books. Yeah. Um, uh, and he writes articles for all different types of websites. And we're going to be chatting with him today about all kinds of crazy stuff. If you're not familiar with his work, he's got a lot of books out there. Uh, just to ramble off a few, uh, Flying Saucers from the Kremlin is one of his new ones. Mm -hmm. He's got a new one coming out called Assassinations, The Plots, Politics, and Powers Behind That'll History, be a good, good Changing book. Murders. Yeah, that's pretty cool. The Slender Man Mysteries, Paranormal Parasites, The Real Men in Black. He's even got a book on Women in Black. Uh, one of my favorites was Bloodline of the Gods. Yep. Talking about people with RH negative blood and the lineage goes back Heck to yeah. perhaps extraterrestrials. Uh, he's even got books on shapeshifters. Hundreds, seems like hundreds of books, but he's written a lot. And uh, if you're a big fan of the paranormal or cryptozoology, uh, UFOs or any of those things, I'm sure you know who Nick Redfern is. He's been appear he's appeared on Ancient Aliens numerous times. He's just a fantastic guy. So we're going to be talking with him, but before we get into that interview... Cam, what have you been doing? I have been uh, working on a remodel. My wife has got me remodeling now with this COVID business going on. And so we've been at the house tearing out not one but two bathrooms. So I've been working on bathroom remodels. <clears throat> and she has been going. Look, she's been planning this for quite some time. So, like, she'll find, like, a light fixture that she likes. Yeah. Like, she's like, I want, and then she buys it. And then, so in my shop... I have stacks of like sinks and light fixtures. Like she's been slowly, slowly piecing, piecing it out. this together. That's a good idea. Yeah. And now the big thing is like this weekend, there is a place not far from where we live that has a bunch of like, uh, not surplus stuff, but it's a lot of building material and things like that. And she wants a freestanding tub. So now I have to go find. So we're going to look at a free freestanding tub this weekend before, before you and I go live on Facebook again. Oh. I'm sorry. YouTube. We're not Facebook live and we're YouTube live streaming oh, again. I was about to say, I didn't know we were on Facebook. Yeah, no, no, no. We are. We're YouTubing it again. I what, did, what did we say we're going to do it again? Four o'clock central, right? Four o'clock central standard time. Yeah, yeah, because that's like in a sweet spot where people from not just the US, but from Europe and Australia and Asia, they can all, it's, it's, it's in a time frame where I think more people can yeah. tune in where, you know, if you do it another time, a lot of people, you know, nobody's going to get up at four in the morning to look at us. <laughs> So I don't want to get up at four in the morning and look at me. Yeah, man. Have your questions ready. Be kind of like last time. We're going to do a recap of the shows that we covered yep. during the month of April. Well, we're going to we try. try. <laughs> we got sidetracked last time real bad. So and, uh, we're going to try. And we're also be doing like, you know, typical stuff, Q and A like like the last one. I think yeah. it's I think it's gonna be fun. Well, let's get into the news. Check this out, Cam. A red eyed winged humanoid was observed near Brandon, Florida. That's right. Yes. Is it Florida man back to no good? It's, it's a Florida woman. It oh, says right. uh, a Brandon, Florida resident observed a red eyed winged humanoid in a nearby tree while waiting in her car for a friend. The woman claims I was picking up a friend and saw a strange creature as I waited. There was a tree not far from where the car was parked. I noticed a gap in the upper part of the tree where it was starting to branch out. Several minutes later, I felt like I was being watched, oddly enough. And when I looked back at the tree, the area where the gap was, something black was sitting there. I looked away, but immediately looked back and noticed these red eyes glaring at me. Of course, I thought I was just seeing things at first. It was in a shadowy area, so no light was shining in the eyes. But they were big, and they were red. As I, as I stared, I realized it had wings and was crouched. You could almost make out knees and legs it looked like a little human. Ooh. Right? Almost looked like it had long, spindly arms as well. The car was facing the tree, so I finally looked away for several more minutes, hoping whatever it was would stop glaring at me. I was afraid for my friend to come out, so I was watching for him, afraid he might be attacked. When I looked back, it was gone. I never saw it come or go. At the time, I wasn't into computers when I finally got one, I did several Google searches 
and almost gave up, and that's when I came across a drawing. Now, this drawing is exactly what I would have drawn if I could draw. What I saw looked almost solid black, but it was also in a shadowy area as the tree, as I mentioned. I would guess it was probably two or feet tall, two or three feet tall if it had been standing. Still creeps me out to this day. I didn't notice any hair on the legs, but I was only 20 to 30 feet away from it. This occurred near Brandon, Florida. Thank you, CS. So it's not a huge winged humanoid. She said it only looked probably two or three feet tall if it and standing up. So it makes me wonder, like, you know, was it an owl or something like that? I mean, I know owls don't have glowing red eyes, but but she clearly describes the thing looking human-like, which is odd to have wings. And before, before – well, go ahead. I'm going to see. Did you have something to say? Well, yeah, I'm the whole time, yeah. Why is it – and you and I have discussed this recently – that every time we discuss uh, like a flying humanoid or like mm-hmm. we talked about with Sasquatch or Dogman or any of these things, the bigger is more scary. Well, couldn't there be the inverse of now there's smaller flying humanoids? Like the idea of those – what were the flying monkeys in one the of Wizard the, of Oz? You remember? Yeah. Remember yeah. they'd send them out, okay? It's to scare the heck out of me Exactly. As a kid. Why couldn't there be something like that? Like a humanoid with wings that's like the Fae we talk about, but imagine it being like a gargoyle yeah. humanoid that's like 24 inches tall. For whatever reason, I know this is going to sound crazy, the, the, a small one like that to me seems more realistic than like a big seven-footer. I know me that too. is totally crazy. I know what you're saying, but I'm the exact same way. You know why? It's because it could hide easier. Yeah. It would eat less. It's easier for to find a place to hide, all of that. But for some reason, the idea of a giant humanoid that's flying by, like, I, just, I don't know. Right? Well, Southwest Florida, especially around the city of Tampa Bay, mm-hmm. uh, is a hot spot for winged humanoid sightings over the years. And are you aware of, you know, the journalist, the TV journalist, Geraldo Riveray? I know Geraldo Riveray, yes. Yeah. Did you know that he had an actual UFO sighting when he was younger and was has been and still is fascinated with UFOs? I did not know that. I know that back in the day, though, while in the business, he had an amazing mustache, second only to Tom Selleck. Yeah, we're talking about Geraldo Rivera. We just... Geraldo. Geraldo Rivera. Rivera. Yeah, but when I, I say Geraldo, I, Geraldo Rivera. Is, that's the old man I used to hunt with. That's what he called the, <laughs> that dude every time was Geraldo Rivera. Yeah, so check this out. Geraldo Rivera, it says, is uh, back in January 1981... Is this when he opened up Al Capone's tomb? No, that was a big it. letdown, yeah. <laughs> Geraldo Rivera, with his then-wife... Cheryl Raymond, they left their Miami home in a, in a sailboat they called the New Wave, and they were planning on enjoying a sailing vacation. And they planned to head down the Miami River and cross the Gulf Stream for a week and to, vi- and to visit the Bohemian Islands. And they eventually ended up on the Bahama Banks. But Rivera recalls his wife had gone to bed one night between 9 and 10 p.m. Now, this is while he was out sailing, and he was feeling very good and wanted to sail through the night. It was a perfect tropical night, he claims, moonless and very starry. It was just the soft hum of his boat as it sailed along, and he eventually, at some point, noticed a light in the sky. He said, I I saw a very bright object over the main mast. He immediately thought it was the planet Venus, but then he said he noticed that it moved, shifting to the left. Now, Rivera, still thinking it was Venus, assumed that he had gotten off course somehow and turned his boat about 90 degrees towards the light. Then he claims that the object moved again. And Rivera turned his boat again. This time, the object moved directly over his boat, streaking back to its original position. This is when he realized that this definitely was not the planet Venus, and he still didn't know what it was. He thought briefly that it might be a helicopter, but he said it was completely silent, so he ruled that out. He said this is when it hit him that while he was you know, observing this strange thing mm-hmm. that he began to think, oh, crap, this thing might actually be pursuing me. And he started to get frightened. He claims that as he watched the light, it suddenly blinked out and it just vanished. And directly after that, Rivera dropped the anchor, he said. He was quite shook up by the encounter and worried that it might come back. He claims at this point he went down below and went to bed without saying a word to his wife. Now, the next morning... He woke up and he told his wife what happened. She, he's, he claims that she scoffed at them at him, said he must have had too much wine or whatever, was just making it up. So they pulled into Nassau the next day. Now, Rivera 
So as soon as he got off the boat, he checked all the local newspapers, and there was not any mention of a UFO. He also talked to some of the locals. None of them had seen anything. So Rivera now, in hindsight, believes that the object was checking him out that net night, trying to figure out who he was. Now, he considers himself a skeptic, but he has no explanation for what he saw. And until this day, he's still very interested in the UFO subject matter. So that's pretty cool. I never really heard about Geraldo Rivera having that kind of a sighting. You've heard of the famous people like Jimmy Carter had a sighting. You've heard about Nixon. I think you did an episode on Jackie Gleason. Russell Crowe. And, and yeah, Russell Crowe is another mm -hmm. one. So I think a lot of people, like we talk about all the time, uh, have experiences with the paranormal and just don't come forward, even famous people. If you've ever been so scared, you dropped your anchor? Because it sounds like that's what he did. And I wonder if he had to go cut his underwear off. Yeah, I don't, I don't I know. I dropped anchor today. <laughs> you get all embarrassed. Yeah, I would want to keep sailing, though. I wouldn't want to just drop anchor and go hide below. because. I and you've become obsessed with people now that sail around the world. I wouldn't say I've come obsessed. I would I, I got say. on a YouTube. You know how it is. You, you, <laughs> you, you find something on YouTube. You're like, man, that's pretty cool. Next thing you know, you're three days deep on it. I started watching this guy sail in like a 20-foot dinghy. Now, a 20-foot sailboat is like a, like a bass boat. Yeah. This dude sails from like California to Hawaii all by himself. And it like halfway through, I think it took him like, I want to say like eight days. But there was one point where the seas are pretty calm and he ain't hardly moving. And he's like, man, I, I underestimated my amount of food I need. I'm like, mm -hmm. oh, my God, bro. You're going to starve to death out there, self-imposed. And the scariest part is, he, you know how he takes a shower? Mm -mm. He has one of those little camping showers, like the kind you fill up with a bag. Yeah. Gravity, you know. So yeah, he, I guess you don't want the salt water on you because right. it's going to chafe or burn, you know, after right. a time. So he, he fills that with fresh water. But instead of showering under that, the, the dude jumps in the ocean and he holds on to a rope that's attached to the sailboat. If he loses that rope, he's done for. So he jumps in, he gets nude, <laughs> jumps in the ocean, and then gets out and then rinses off with fresh water. That's how he showers. And like, mind you, this is like an eight day trip. I'd be like, well, I'm just going to go eight days without shower. If I'm by myself, I'm going to be stinky <laughs> till I get there. I'm not. First of all, y'all all know that's not for me. That's an adventure I'll never go on. Mind how crazy the, is that's, that? No, no, no. Hell anyway, no. so that video let, you know, once YouTube knows you liked something. It well, starts see, popping up more and more, and the next thing you know, I've watched twelve videos on people sailing. And now you're what you're talking about, Geraldo sailing. I don't want to sail. Don't I, I don't get it twisted. Now, weren't you a big fan of the the rapper or the singer Geraldo? I don't remember that guy. One of the guy that sang Suave, yeah, Rico, oh, Suave. Yeah. Oh, yeah, huge Rico. Fan. Huge fan, and I forgot about <laughs> Suave. <laughs> forgot about that guy. Dude, in his acid wash jeans, no shirt, black leather coat, do rag. In Miami, not dressed for Miami. Yeah, it looked like Diego Maradona back in the day. <laughs> right? Probably consumed the same amount of coke I eat now. <laughs> well, I have you something here. If you're going to be talking about flying stuff, sure, I'm going to be talking about flying stuff. We got some uh, wing cryptid sightings that took place on reservation land that some Native Americans have sent around. And, uh, and a Thunderbird. Cool, yeah. I've got some cool stories here. One of them says this. I was driving near our home on the Fort Berthold Reservation, North Dakota, and it was about four in the afternoon in 1987. It was full daylight, just me and my son, who was six and was asleep at the time. I looked to my right across the highway along a shelter belt at a tree height. I saw what resembled, you ready? A stingray flying along the trees. Here we go. I slowed my car and tried to watch it for as long as I could, and then it was too far down south to really see anymore. The object moved like a stingray swimming, and it was huge, about the size of a car. And I have not seen anything like that since. So, there's a sighting took place in 87. So, all the way back in 87, we have these stingrays, again, in the air. That people are spotting. Yeah, the, the flying manta ray. I don't know yep. why that shape is so prevalent, but I mean, there's, it's, you'd be shocked at how many sightings there are of something several. similar. Yeah. Here's one that says, uh, my wife and I saw something gliding in the Yakima Res in Washington. We were headed to Yakima to pick up some groceries, and I saw it as I pulled up to the light. It was around 12 or 1 in the afternoon. It was sunny as hell, but this thing was pitch black. Now, it was far from us, but it was too big to be the, a type of bird. And when I got my wife's attention to look, she saw the exact same thing. And I tried to speed up to catch up with it and get a better glimpse of it. 
And when we get to where I had saw it, it was nowhere to be found. I don't know if it vanished, evaporated, or flew off, and I don't know what it was, but I have seen it several times since. Mm. Now, how crazy is it that you've seen several yeah. things of this? Here's one that says, in Caddo Nation, Oklahoma, I saw something one night on my way home from work. Now, here's another one, Philly. It stood four and a half to five feet tall. Its face was like a human's, but it had characteristics like that of a bird. Its feathers were fluffy, like putting a wet feather in a light socket. And as I drove by, it must have flown because the last thing I know, I'm hearing wings flapping. So at least they're hearing it this time. And the moonlight is blocked out as it flew over. And I put the pedal to the metal and got home as fast as I could. Yeah, I don't blame you. So the last one goes like this. The first sighting I had was in 2011 in Northern California. I was going for an evening walk and noticed something fly over the road that's nearby. It was barely visible and as dark as the night sky. It was triangle shaped, so I assumed it was as large or it was a large bird. Now I told my sister what I had seen and a few minutes later we both got to see the same creature. We both agree. It's too large to be any type of owl or eagle. I thought maybe it was a condor, but according to a website, those birds cannot see at night. Now jump ahead two years later, and it's March of 2013. I go outside to get some fresh air, and I notice a flying object over the house. This time, I get a real close look, and I can't believe my eyes. The only description that I could think of matches what I saw is a pterodactyl. Now I'm not joking. It glides by totally silent and makes a turn in the sky, and I can see underneath the wings. I call my sister to come outside, but it's gone. And 10 minutes later, it flies back over the house, barely visible this time, and it has climbed to a higher elevation. The creature is as big as a pickup. The wingspan is larger than any flying bird we know of. Now jump ahead to June of 2013, and it's late at night, and I have the door open for air, and we hear the loudest scream roar of an unknown creature. This is in Oklahoma? No, no, no. This one's in California. Northern oh, okay. California. Okay. I'm with you. It goes on to say that the dogs in the area were barking after the roar. I step out on the porch, and I don't see anything, but I hear the noise again. And by the sound of it, you can tell it's circling in the sky. My sister also hears the noise as well. I thought the neighbors would all wake up because the noise was so loud. The noise was like if a horse could roar. Now, I've never heard any noises like this in my entire life. And where we are startled and confused because we still wonder what we saw or heard. I'd just like to see if anyone out there reading this or hearing this has seen or heard of anything similar because it's very strange. We live on a reservation in Northern California. I don't smoke anything weird or drink. I know that's the first thing people might think. Thanks. So, yeah, I, that is the first thing I yeah. would think. To answer any of your questions, he just answered them. Like, no, that's that's not it. That's, But so, again, we have some larger stuff, seeing things as big as a truck. We have flying yeah. manta rays. But, again, we have one of those little ones, something small like that. Man, I love the idea of small flying creatures. I like the idea of like like thunderbirds, not not nothing reptilian, not nothing like the Mothman yeah. or or Jeepers Creepers. I like the idea of just a giant bird that somehow has remained undiscovered. I'm I'm with you, like yeah, like where you could see like a tail feather would be six foot long. Yeah, like it would be cool to find a giant feather like that, like a four or five foot oh, long dude. wing feather or something. You'd be like, "What?" Stick that in your cowboy hat. <laughs> right? Yeah. Right. Well, yeah. let's stop messing around with the news. Let's get into the interview with Mr. Nick Redfern. I hope you like this. Let's take a break. You're listening to Expanded Perspectives.
All right, everybody. As we alluded to right before going into break, we got our our old school buddy on the line with us, and it has been uh, it's been hectic around here. But we have been jumping up and down to get to talk to Mister Nick Redfern, and now we've got him. Nick, what's going on, brother? And go ahead, tell him what you're drinking. Uh, I'm a Jello. Yes, <laughs> a nice um, cold one with a cold glass, and just how I like it. <laughs> Folks, he told us when we were talking to him off air right before this started. And he goes, hey, let me grab a quick bottle of water real quick. We're like, okay. And he's gone for a little bit. He comes back, and he just gave up on the water, went straight Modelo. That's how he started, just straight. We're just going to cold beer it up this evening. And that's yeah. how this whole segment is going to go. We, that's how this is going to be. We, had, we asked Nick. Everybody gets him on, of course, to talk about his books. We did the same thing. And when you're talking about Nick's books, the joke is always because he writes them like three a week. That's true. That's true. What did you look up? Kylie wrote eight in 2017. Yeah, I think so. Nine in 2018. Something like that. He finally six, slowed six and he slowed down to four in 2019. And during this COVID, he's written 11. There's been 11 books written in the last yeah. 53 days, folks. <laughs> so we didn't want to go that circle. We didn't want to get him on here and talk about the books and all that stuff. For those that are uninitiated, he writes a lot of articles. He writes a lot of articles for a lot of different places. And he writes for our friends, Ben and Aaron, over at Mysterious Universe. And there are articles over there. And, and of course, everybody's like, don't don't tell them about, you know, you're not supposed this is a competition. You don't. It's not a competition. Yeah, right. <laughs> we love Ben and Aaron. We love Mysterious Universe. They're one of the, the OGs of doing this. And Nick has some amazing articles written over there. And we're just going to start picking his brain about the, not only the articles, but the great stories that go along with it. Because we think we've picked out some doozies. So, Mr. Redfern, are you ready to rock and roll, sir? <laughs> yes, I am. <laughs> All right, I'm excited. So, I know everybody, like we said, we've been in lock. You have been mulling over all of your – I saw a picture of you, Nick, not long ago, of you uh, sitting there on your couch. And that library you have, sir, is impressive. So, Oh, is that the one where the, the girl was filming the yeah. um, TV documentary? Yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that was uh, about – I think that was about a year ago, something like that. But, I'm uh, hoping that no one lived, like I'm hoping you're on like the first floor of your building because if anyone's living under you, that's a dangerous place to be with the weight of all those books. <laughs> well, you know, I, I won't say I often think of that, but occasionally I do <laughs> because I've got, I, I dread to think what the weight this uh, apartment is in books because <laughs> I actually am on a second floor. <laughs> <laughs> One yes. of the days, there's going to be this huge, you know, newspaper headline, uh, sort of apartment collapses. On. The, it the is, whole it's, side it's, airs out. <laughs> it's, it's massive. It's a good collection. I've actually been to your place a couple times, Nick, back in the day. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's it's massive. You know, back then, I would I would go, whenever you came out with a new book, we could order it and wait a couple of days. Of course, Amazon's Are much faster, <laughs> much faster now than they were then. But yeah, or I could just go right to the source. So I would just go to your house, text you, hey, I'm nearby. Do you mind if I swing by? No, come over. Come on, I got books. Well, it shows. And so for those, I mean, it, we get lucky that we have, because we have a lot of books here also. So we get lucky that we have that to stuff to, to buy your time and then kind of, you know, get you through some of this stuff. So that's the reason I wanted to pick to do a bunch of these different articles and stories that you had written is to give people an array of it not to be the same thing, of, to give them a big mixture. So starting out is like I had told you, back on uh, one of the Elite shows in the last few weeks, I had did a story about uh, haunted castles. And I used part of your article and discussed it and talked about you in it as you had given the story of like the Orford Castle, I, I guess the monster, uh, if you want to re refer to it as the monster. So – We'll give them a quick update on this whole thing. I'll have you discuss, but I want to know what brought you. Like, when did you first hear of that story? What the the Orford Wild Man? Yes, sir. Yes, you know. sir. Um, probably when I was a kid, maybe sort of nine or, or ten, something like that. Because um, you know, the UK being relatively small and an island, it's very kind of enclosed. So I guess you know whether it's the news or you know and some bands bringing out a new song kind of thing. Everybody kind of knows because, you know, it's such a small place, really. And um, so I think you can kind of apply that with things like the 
you know, the Orford Wild Man. It's sort of you know, a lot of people in the UK sort of like the old sort of folklore and um, legends of the UK. So, you know, it's no wonder these stories kind of develop quite quickly in terms of people knowing about them. And um, interestingly enough, Orford um, Castle, which is on the east coast of England, it's actually only about six miles from Rendlesham Forest, where the famous UFO events in 1980. And um, so the the whole area is kind of like a magical, mysterious place, mm-hmm. so to speak. But the story itself actually goes back, uh, well, now, sort of close to almost like a thousand years ago. And um, it revolves around the capture of this strange-looking, sort of hairy, humanoid figure that was caught in the waters off the coast of um, of Orford, because uh, basically Orford and the castle, um, there's, there's like the, the beach, and then you've just got this huge area of water called the North Sea. And the North Sea is basically, um, on the one side of it, you've got the UK, and the other side you've got like Scandinavia, like um, Norway, um, Sweden, and so on. So it's a huge body of water that surrounds that particular uh, east side of the UK. And um, in the story, um, a number of the um, workers at the castle supposedly saw this hair-covered humanoid. I won't say it was a Bigfoot, because it wasn't described as a Bigfoot. It was described as like a primitive human with long hair and a long beard. You know, you don't really see creatures like Bigfoots described as having, you know, like long hair or, um, you know, a long beard. It, it, it seems to be more like a shorter uniform hair. So the chances are this was some sort of, you know, one of these ancient so-called wild men that you can find stories of all around the world. And um, in the story that some of the workers from the castle managed to capture him and they took him back to the uh, castle and he was put into the dungeon, which isn't perhaps not the nicest thing they could have done, you know. <laughs> but, um, and apparently he supposedly became quite tame and they would feed him on raw meat. That was about the only thing he would eat, would, it was um, raw meat. And they got quite tame and most days they would sort of let him... Um, I'm on ropes, like on different kind of lengths of rope, and they would be able to sort of guide him into the water without him escaping. Apparently, he lived there quite happily um, in the dungeon areas um, for, for quite a long time until one day he managed to escape or he just decided he wanted to go on somewhere else and he <laughs> supposedly um, sort of um, took to the waters and vanished and, and was never seen again. But it, but it's interesting that there are actually in that area, the, the county of Suffolk, there are a lot of stories of primitive hairy humans. Um, there's a, a famous story of um, two young children that, that became known as the Green Children of Wilpit. Yeah. And, um, you know that story? Yes, sir. Yeah, well, it's like these two young children who came walking out the woods and they had this sort of slightly strange colour to them and uh, they spoke a a weird language and they kind of were almost like what you would call feral children. And Walpit is actually in the same county as um, Orford. So you've got, again, you know, this sort of wild human angle. And one of the interesting but controversial aspects about these stories about the wild men in on the east coast of england one of the theories is that although it sounds extreme and unlikely one of the theories is that possibly there could have been surviving pockets of previous like earlier men like neanderthal and crow oh i got you yeah and that possibly some of them against all the odds may have survived up until, say, around about eight, nine hundred years ago, which would be incredible if it's true. But if they became isolated in what is now the UK, and back then, you know, there's no roads, no cars, no buildings to speak of, you know. And so the whole country really back then was just totally woodland and forest, you know. And um, so... It's, you know, you look at it from that way, it's plausible that if pockets did survive 
and then occasionally were seen or possibly even captured. You know, maybe we were looking really at, like, you know, the final um, vestiges, if you like, of um, early humans, mm-hmm. Neanderthal, um, Cro-Magnon. And um, I doubt we'll ever be able to prove it, even if we found you know, bones, etc. today. I mean, the chances of finding something like that are very slim. But, you know, you often find with folklore and mythology and things like that, there usually is like um, uh, a portion of truth about it, even if the story's got sort of ex- exaggerated or changed over the centuries. Yeah, that's 100. The thing that strikes me the, the strangest about that story was when they found him, he was in the water. And then they were taking him back to the water. It's just odd for me to think of a wild man or even a, a, a you know prehistoric man that wants to go spend that much time in the ocean, especially yeah. that cold ass water over there. Well, that's true. I mean, one thing I would say though um, is that that East Coast area, where actually I spent a lot of time over there as a kid, because my uh, my mother she grew up in that area. So you know, on vacations we would often sort of go over that area. And if you get into the waters there, I mean, they're filled with, like, crab and, um, you know, uh, mountains of fish, you know, Mm -hmm. and um, people do go fishing there, you know, and I mean, and that part of England is very much, um, you know, most of the food or the, you know, the most popular food in that area is is seafood because, you know, it all backs onto um, the, the North Sea. So in that sense, you know, I mean... In the same way that people there still love their seafood today in that area, <laughs> maybe they exactly the same as the yeah. you know the, the situation eight hundred years ago, and uh, you know they developed a flair perhaps to to catch these you know the the fish and reel in you know the crabs and the the lobsters and things like that. So, uh, but the idea of it is one of those like you said. Yeah. I, I can almost I can almost believe it. Like yeah, there are. Mm-hmm you know, pockets that was left untouched. And then they just every now and again, the remnants would still show back up. There's one more I want to ask you about. And you're probably going to know that's the why I want to ask. Glamis Castle in Scotland. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. That description of whatever this thing is, the monster of Glamis, mm-hmm. I can't even, mm, they, I, I can't wrap my head around it. So, it, it took it, it. This is supposed to. Is this supposed to be a person? Is that what they're saying? Well, it, it's very much sort of <laughs> up in the air. It, it, everybody calls it Glamis Castle, but it's actually the, the original pronunciation is Glam's Castle. Uh, but but everybody Glam's says Glamis because it looks like that's how it's spelled. I'll it's pronounce it Glamis forever. The same <laughs> as the I, Thames. I call it as well. <laughs> the Thames <laughs> River and gl- the Glamis Castle. <laughs> yeah, kind of Glamis. It kind of sounds a bit posh, you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> this is true. <laughs> where, yeah. Where are we going? Oh, we're going to Glamis Castle. You know? <laughs> no, let's go to Glamis Castle. <laughs> See, that's the punk rocker coming out in Nick because he refuses yeah. to follow. He's like, no, I'm not exactly. talking about this posh stuff. It's only Glamis yeah. if you've been there. That's right. <laughs> yeah, you're like, no. It's called how it looks, <laughs> yeah. but um, but yeah, Glamis Castle um, is a very old castle, and it was actually and still is um, owned by the the British royal family. And um, like a lot of old castles, you know, there's like a lot of um, you know creepy castles and creepy stories and legends of you know tunnels under the the castle and things like this. But the most enduring mystery revolves around this uh, i'm sort of whether you call it like a creature or a deformed person i'm not sure but reportedly that um the family which uh, has lived in the uh, the castle itself literally for centuries you know for generations and it's been passed through uh, the entire um, lineage so to speak and um this creature or this deformed person, whatever it was, supposedly the family um, didn't want anything to do with it, whether it was embarrassment or fear of how it looked. But all we know for sure is that supposedly it was locked away in a secret room and it was described as being sort of gigantic, sort of like a bloat, just like a bloated person kind of thing, but covered in hair. And supposedly, um, 
it lived until around about the age of about 120, which is, if that's true, you know, then that either it had some sort of very strange, you know, sort of mutation which allowed it to live that long, or or we just don't know what it was. But the the story that was basically the story, the idea of this, um, basically like a humanoid figure, but covered in hair and had a very barrel-like um, stomach and and um, and chest. And in some of the reports, there's um, vague references to it having a head that kind of just sat on its shoulders that, as if there was no neck. You're describing me, Nick. <laughs> <laughs> That's what you just described. Kyle's pointing at me this entire time you're talking. He's pointing there, pointing, and you said the head. He just pointed right at me. He's like, That's you. <laughs> the barreled chest, the, the hair all over, the no neck. I mean... That's a description of Cam. <laughs> well, you got me. Day you'll get, maybe you should get go there one of the days and um, you know and, and check it all out because it is a it is a cool place and um, and like a lot of the old churches and castles and things like cathedrals in the UK, they make sure they still are sort of left and and restored in their original state. You know, so um, but yeah, that's that's sort of a fascinating story because. It's so mysterious as to what this person or this creature was, and it's and it's really difficult to sort of rationalise what it could have been. You know, what could be covered in hair, have no neck, and live to one hundred and twenty? Yeah, know, it's, uh, there's not much I can think of. No, <laughs> I can't even speculate. And we all speculate about crazy things, and I can't be like, ah, I don't have any idea what you could even say that was. Yeah. And it's crazy. I, I I remember that story. Um, <clears throat> shifting gears, Nick, I want to talk about um, some of the stuff you've written about on UFOs. And one thing that caught my eye recently was not just the fact of UFOs or alien abduction, but strange things that have been seen aboard UFOs. Mm. Uh, I think you recently wrote an article about a bicycle uh, in Area 51. <laughs> also... Uh, alien cats, uh, dogs, uh, like spider-like things. Can you give some more details on on what what I'm talking about? Well, yeah, I mean, when I'm doing these articles, you know, I try not to just sort of go over old ground. I mean, sometimes you have to, you know, but um, but there's plenty of stuff out there where you can sort of come across, you know, some genuinely weird stories. And I thought, you know, well, why not just do an article on abductees taken on board UFOs, but actually ask the abductees what they saw when they were taken on the UFO. Now, of course, in most of the stories, you know, the, the answer is, well, you know, they were sort of laid down on like a, like a lab table and subjected to, um, you know, medical experiments and that kind of thing. But, you know, in some respects, it's more intriguing and interesting to find out what else was going on in there or, you know, what could, what were the surroundings on the UFO? And that's where it kind of gets really weird. And, um, and I spoke to, um, to uh, an abductee some years ago um, who, as you said, um, mentioned about how they'd seen on board a UFO nothing less than a bicycle wheel. Now, right. you know, that sounds bizarre, which it is. But on the other hand, you know, the, the person came across quite credible, very credible. But, um, it, you know, people are going to say, well, just dismiss it. But the way I look at it is that it was so weird. I can't really see anybody thinking of fabric fabricating it in the first place. You know what I mean? Right. Because it is so bizarre you know if you're gonna if somebody's gonna hoax an alien abduction event i don't think they would say oh you know i'm gonna say there was a bicycle wheel on the on the ufo <laughs> you know where, where would that even come from you know right no I, so, I agree with you that's what makes it so yeah. interesting i think even i think betty and barney hill when they were abducted had mentioned that not just were there grays on board but they actually what looked like humans but in uniform with even like a Scottish accent or something like that, I remember uh, reading about. And that's what it's intriguing is of all the things that are strange and and people not knowing what's happening to them, what's going on when they're aboard these craft, when they see something that they recognize like a bicycle wheel, to me that lends credibility. I don't know why I feel that way, but to me, it's like if you're going to make this long tail up, why would you remember to add that part to mm -hmm. it? Yeah, 
I mean, because, you know, ironically, for a lot of people, it would sort of lessen the credibility of the story. You know, why even insert it into the story at all? But as kind of like an aside to that, um, coincidentally, a few years back, and I don't think the two cases are directly connected, but a few years ago, I got a story from a guy who used to work at Area 51 years ago, actually decades ago. I think it was the early 70s. And he said that... There's no UFO component directly in it, but he said that one day the security personnel that sort of checked around the whole area, as you know, this is, um, as I said, the early 1970s, you know, they'd sort of routinely every day, you know, sort of patrol the place. And so they said they found a bicycle. And supposedly it was sort of like, you know, smashed to pieces or dented and destroyed. And the, the theory or uh, the way it seemed, was as if this bicycle had been dropped from an incredibly high level, you know, kind of as if somebody had parachuted out of a plane, that kind of height. But it was in the no-fly, no-go area of Area 51, and nothing had been picked up on radar, and, you know, nobody in the, you know, in the military towers was seeing anything coming down towards, you know, to the base and whatever. So, um... That's kind of an interesting little story, and I think it would be too much for it to be too much of a coincidence for the two cases to be connected. I don't think they were, mm. but you know, I mean, stranger things have happened. But um, but yeah, you know, the idea of coming across a bicycle of all things on Area Fifty One, looking like it's been dropped for um, from a huge height. You know, you can actually, and Area 51, of course, connected with UFOs, you know, you do have to wonder if there was some sort of abduction event and maybe there was some, like a fight or a confrontation and who knows, perhaps the the bicycle got thrown out or, you know, chucked out or whatever. And um, I don't know, but it, again, it was sort of one of those weird stories that why on earth would somebody even right. make that up? You know, it's you know, so it's strange, strange and bizarre. Sense. Right. That, that, yeah. I agree with you. For whatever reason, when we get stories sent to us, mm. believe it or not, sometimes the stranger it is or just a little detail lends more credibility. Just a little tiny detail that somebody mm. wouldn't miss when you can obviously yeah. tell when someone's making something up. Um, could you tell us about <clears throat> the event that happened uh, back in November 1980 with the policeman, Alan Godfrey? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, Alan Godfrey was a retired um, police officer, or he's a, a retired police, police <laughs> officer still now. And uh, he lives in uh, North Yorkshire, which is in the north of England. Um, it's sort of getting close towards the border with Scotland, if you look it up on a map. And um, like a lot of police officers, um, you know, a lot of his work was done at night, you know, night shifts and sort of patrolling the, the local villages and towns you know, sort of 1 a.m. in the morning till 7 in the morning, that kind of thing. And he, most of his, you know, his excursions on a nightly basis, just normal stuff, you know, that the cops do, just sort of looking out for burglars, trying to get into homes, making sure there's no car accidents, that kind of thing. And um, he said that on this one particular night in November 1980, he was driving along one of these, you know, just, Typically, little villages um, in the UK, nobody around, you know, sort of pitch black. And he saw this strange thing in the road, sort of semi on the road. And at first, he thought it was like um, possibly like a bus, you know, or a vehicle um, that perhaps broken down, something like that. So he got closer and he realized you know, it wasn't anything like that. It seemed to be some sort of craft. And from what he could um, sort of... Uh, remember at the time was that he saw the object, whatever it was, and then the next moment he was further down the road and there'd been this something, some kind of flash. And, um, and then he realized he was further down on the road where he shouldn't have been. And the object, whatever it was, was gone. Now, like a lot of people who've been abducted, he talked about how, you know, he, he realized something strange had happened but the more he thought about it and had dreams, he realized that there was something that had been sort of erased from his memory or has been prevented from coming out. And so he decided to go under um, hypnosis, excuse me, hypnotism to try and find out what happened in that uh, missing period. 
and it turns out that he'd been taken on board a craft. And interestingly, he described the entity, if you like, which had taken him on board. And it wasn't so much a um, an abduction. It was more along the lines of an invite onto the craft. And it, it was described very much like a, a human-looking um, alien, if you like, with the long hair and a beard and um, kind of like a hippie-type alien. If you like. <laughs> and um, But what was interesting was that he said that when he was on the on the craft itself, he saw this large dog-like animal. When I say dog-like, he said it wasn't quite like our dogs, but it was clearly a kind of dog, about the size of a German shepherd, completely black in colour. And what it was, why it was there, there was no answer to that at all, but he, he was sure on what he'd seen. And um, that's in sort of um, like a trimmed down version is the story. And as I said, the next thing he knew, he was further down the road. So, you know, you've got all the components, you know, somebody uh, late at night, um, missing time, taking on board a UFO, some sort of interaction. And then the next thing, you know, a, there's clearly been some sort of missing time and uh, the person isn't too sure what happened. And um, Alan Godfrey, you know, he, he stood by his story and continu uh, continues to um, to follow this story and, you know, and, and demonstrate how and why, you know, he's absolutely sure that, that he had this experience. And, of course, you know, as a police officer, sort of, um, you know, well-versed with night work, you know, patrolling the streets. And, um, you know, he was the perfect person to be up at that time. And um, I guess in many respects, in terms of abductions, it's sort of like, in terms of calibre and and um, knowledge of it in the UK, it's probably similar to, you know, the Betty and Barney Hill mm. case over here in the US. It's sort of got that kind of... Um, you know, sort of sense of history about it and everything. Right. And when, and just like you mentioned, um, him being a police officer, he's a trained observer. And for whatever reason, when I hear stories or accounts from whether they're airline pilots or policemen or doctors, people that are specialists in their field, to me, their story, their stories have more validity. And also the, the most recent uh, version of the Predator movie, the Predators had dogs on there. So I totally believe that. Well, yeah, I mean, I actually wrote a, an article once um, some time ago about the Chupacabra in Puerto Rico where um, some some of the locals sort of made parallels between the Chupacabra and the sort of the predator, you know, from the movies, the mm. idea that the Chupacabras were extraterrestrial and using Puerto Rico as like um, as hunting grounds, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I picture them using them like hunting yeah. dogs, you know. Um, yeah. Uh, and one more story before we change topics again is you, you mentioned that you met a woman in, from Houston and she was talking about her abduction back in 1977 or so. And she talked about the grays putting something that kind of resembled a spider, but wasn't a spider on her. Do you remember that story? Yeah. I mean, yeah, this was back in the seventies. This was an interesting story again. And it was one where unfortunately, you know, very often you get a really good story, an interesting story, but the witness, you know, is it's not so much a case of, no, I don't want to, you know, go on the record. It's like, hell no, I don't want to go on the record, you know. Mm -hmm. And um, and that was kind of the case there. And, and she described being on board a UFO and there was this sort of spidery type creature um in there as well, but which was clearly bigger than any kind of conventional spider you'd ever find on Earth, you know. We're talking about <laughs> something kind of like the, the face huggers in, in Alien, you know, the I'm Alien out. movies. Nope, nope, <laughs> nope. Yeah, I don't like spiders <laughs> Throw myself <laughs> off of that place. I'm out. <laughs> but um, kind of like that sort of shape and size, you know, and, um, and she had... She had kind of memories that were vague in one sense, but clear in others. And she had memories of this spider kind of getting close to her face and possibly putting something up her nose. But then she also had 
memories, which I don't think I expanded too much on it in the article, but she also talked about having memories of something being put into her throat by this creature, or that possibly it had actually, you know, stretched out one of its limbs into her throat. And there was also, she said, and, and again, I think I abbreviated this, but um, she also talked about um, one of her ears was sore the next day, as if something had been pushed into there. But the, the big thrust of it all, of course, in terms of weird things on a UFO, was this sort of scuttling, face-hugging type um, spider running around the floor of this UFO. Ugh. I hope that UFO crashed into a volcano <laughs> after it dropped her off. <laughs> <laughs> that thing sounds absolutely <laughs> everything on there is nothing you want down in here no i think anything to do with you know i mean spiders you know there's nothing really wrong with it but i mean if, you, if they're sort of you know crawling up your face and something's going up your nose that's a bit different you know? yeah yeah it's, it's <laughs> dropping parasites into your body like oh no yeah. i'm good i'm good yeah. i have that one. <laughs> i've got a question for you too and, and like Kyle and I had discussed off air with you. Now we've discussed this before. So instead of UFO and I'm going to shift it and bring it back to the great state of Texas, all the way down near Del Rio. Now I've got family that have a, a lake house down near Del Rio, actually on the lake there in Del Rio. And, all, and I've been down there when I was a kid and all that. And there's not a lot down in that part of Texas, a lot of rock, a lot of dust. You know, it's it's real rough country kind of right down in that area. But this is the story of the wolf girl down on the along the Devil's River. And for those that don't know about the Devil's River, do you a quick YouTube search. It's an amazing place. And like we've talked about, Kyle and I would love to go. We're still talking about kayaking it. We just haven't done it. But we have discussed this a little bit. And Nick, I'm glad you wrote about this because I'm without knowing it, I was wanting to get your take on it to find out what you thought went on down here because I know that there's been other more recent cases. I believe there was one of the Russian girl that was raised by like dogs or her family. You know, she just grew up more with the dogs and we've talked about that stuff too, but I wanted to get your take on the fact of this. Was this girl just a little feral child? Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. I mean, my personal view on this case is that, you know, we aren't talking about a monster or an unknown animal or something mm -hmm. like that. I think this was almost like what you would call, you know, a tragic um, real-life story of a young girl who'd sort of gone feral, so to speak, and not only lived in the wilds, um, but also lived in the wilds with, uh, with a pack of wolves. And the story is that she was extremely young, which kind of makes me think maybe, you know, she'd wandered off and the family lost her, you know, and frantically went looking but never found her. And she essentially was, like, adopted as kind of the equivalent of a cub, you know. Mm -hmm. And um, and there were stories that sort of spread a period around about, I think, probably somewhere about 15 years, maybe 10 years, something like that, that she, she was seen... Uh, occasionally, now and again, but always with one or more um, wolves. And interestingly, um, the people who said they saw her with the uh, wolves said that those wolves were cubs. So it kind of makes me wonder if they were, if she was sort of helping to, you know, teach the younger ones to um, to hunt, you know, yeah. the way that she'd been taught as well. So. Um, you know, it's sort of a fascinating story because, you know, all around the world you can find brief stories and of, um, you know, something along the lines of feral children. And, um, you know, you look, given the, the sheer amount of landscape, you know, around Texas and in Texas, and I mean, you've got everything, you know, you've got desert, you've got forest, woodland, you name it. And... Um, I mean, some of these areas, you know, that um, where there's good hunting ground, you could easily understand how they could stay hidden and just happily live, you know, with their wolf mm -hmm. parents, so to speak. So, um, and that, you know, that doesn't to me sound at all, um, you know, implausible. I think, you know, the, the idea, I mean, wolves are very, you know, people think of us, they're savage, savage monsters. They're not, you know, they're... Uh, they're very smart. Yeah, they're very smart, and 
you know, they they keep away from people and uh, contrary to a lot of people think, they don't sort of, you know, um, corner you in the woods and, um, you know, attack you, you know, unless, you know, there was something like, you know, the a really bad winds so or there's no food and they're desperate. For the most part, though, they won't attack us uh, at all. You know, they're very family-oriented. So, you know, to come across like a two-foot-tall little girl, you know, Maybe it would have been seen by them as as something different, you know, something to to help. You know, it's hard to know what goes through an animal's mind, but um, you know, I mean, if you've got a dog or a cat, you know, they're very affectionate and fun mm-hmm. and you know playful, and maybe that's how they saw her. You know, and she, they saved her in a strange way. It never gives her age, do they? Do they ever speculate on how old she was when she went missing? Not really, but they. They do say that uh, in the original story, she was described as being a small girl, and she was de- still described as looking like a young girl, um, sort of seven or eight years later. So we can assume a toddler. Makes, yeah, so it kind of makes me think that to start with, you know, she may have been, I don't know, four or five, possibly the latest, and then sort of eight, nine years later, she would still be fairly small at like the age of 12 or something like that. So, so that would that would make perfect sense if she was taken in by the wolves. She could have nursed. Yeah, she could have done be, everything. It was something that yeah. she could take care of. She knew how to go to the bathroom, how to walk. She knew how to do all that by herself probably by the time she – or had a pretty good idea of it rather. Yeah, and I think the, the last time somebody ever saw her, that was with a pack – of wolves and um i was on like um you know on the edge of a of a, a river or somewhere and then you know she was never seen again or at least if she was you know nobody else admitted to having seen her so which you know is not impossible but um you know somebody might have said well nobody's going to tell it nobody's going to believe me if i tell them you know yeah it is so odd to think that that could have happened back then because that really wasn't that long ago no, when right. all this yeah. was going down yeah. Like it's not like it's not just the idea, I guess, of seeing because everybody's instantly going to help a child. Yeah, maybe not an adult, but you're going to want to help a child. And then whenever, just like they, the whole story talks about, is the, where they caught her, and then she got loose because the the wolves showed back up. They you know they ended up killing the wolf she was with, and they brought her in, tied her up, didn't know what to do with her. And then that night, the story goes, the wolves surrounded the area and panicked a lot of the animals, and she gets loose. Takes yeah. off again. You're like that. Kind of makes sense. It, well, yeah, and I think you know that that whole angle of you know protection and whatever, you know, really does kind of suggest that um, you know she had been sort of um, brought into the fold. You know, mm-hmm. were trusted and were, were seen. Okay, they, um, you know, they were um, real normal people, but you know, for whatever reason, you know, they decided that. Uh, she was okay, you know, for the for the pack. So. Yeah, and I always, especially about this story, is I think about the wolves learning from her the things they can't do. And what I mean by that is, like, there might have been something stuck in a wolf, maybe thorns or something, and she, with thumbs, can take them out. And the wolves yeah. are kind of taken aback by the fact that she can do things that they can't do, mm-hmm. you know, like any other dog. Like, you know, dogs, you know, they can't scratch themselves on the head, you know, the way, like, so we're patting on them. Kind of the same way along those lines is that maybe she's doing something, you know, that kind of caught their attention too when she was little, and then as mm-hmm. it grew up, like that was she knew her place with the pack, and and they took care of her and the whole thing. It's just I don't know. It's also that romantic side. It's kind of romantic to think that that could have happened. Well, I mean, it's plausible because I mean we're talking about 1845 when this happened, and if anyone's interested in. You know, checking it out. It's actually the uh, the Devil's River uh, near Del Royo, and um, you know it was only 1845. So, and if they were, you know, the, the walls are good hunters, and they stayed away from us, they may not really have had any exposure to humans at all. So maybe, you know, in other words, they'd never been attacked or hunted by mm-hmm. wolves, possibly by humans, possibly. So maybe they just saw her as what she was, you know, harmless, really. And it also may be the thing, too, that those are Mexican wolves and not northern, like, huge mountain wolves that most people have in their minds right now, is the Mexican Mm -hmm. wolves are just a little bit bigger than a coyote. 
So yeah. you're not talking about a massive animal to start with because they can't be, especially in that part of Texas. There's not a lot for them. There's a lot of yeah. hustling you got to do to eat down there. Yeah. But uh, one of the most intriguing aspects of the story, in which a lot of people forget or don't necessarily realize, is that the last time she was seen was in 1852 um, on a sandbar on the Rio Grande. But what was going on at that particular time when she was seen for the last time, um, there was a team of surveyors out there looking to construct a new route to El Paso. So that makes me think that, you know, with the in sort of infringement of technology and new roads and things like that, maybe she was not seen again because they'd all moved on. You yeah. Know, that, mm. um, they might have so moved deeper south. Yeah, and I think that, that angle of, you know, uh, the fact that she w was not seen after, you know, the whole area was being revamped and then she, the she was gone and they were gone, it does make, make me think, like you said, you know, they moved on whether north, south, east, west, we don't know. But, um, you know, it'd be fascinating if we could ever find the evidence, but um, I don't think that'll happen. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, back then, no TV, you know, no internet, nothing. You know, nobody really would be out there looking, looking for her. You know. Yeah, by the time they got the information, it might be eight, nine months after the yeah. original sighting. So by the time yeah. you even knew about it, it's a year and a half before you even got back out to where they started from. That's right. Man, <laughs> you're blowing my mind. Well, thanks uh, so much, Nick, for coming on with us. It's been a while. Uh, tell the people out there listening where they can get your books, uh, where they can follow you. And also, I know you're working on more than one book right now. Uh, what are you working on, or, or can you even tell us that? Yeah, sure. Um, well, if people want to contact me, uh, I've got a blog called World of Whatever. So if you just look up Nick Redfern, World of Whatever, you'll find my blog, and people can reach me there. Or they can reach me at Twitter, uh, Nick Redfern UFO, uh, also at Facebook. And um, as you said, I've got the Assassinations book out right now. And I've got two books coming out this year, which actually are already on Amazon, although they won't be out for a few months. One um, is called Monsters of the Deep, and it's everything to do with like sea serpents, uh, lake monsters, giant squid, giant turtles, mermaids, you name it. And, and the other one uh, is called The Martians, and that comes out in October. And that's like a study of the theory that there w may once have been um, intelligent life on Mars, and there could have been a civilization on Mars as well. Man, that is awesome. Well, again, thanks for coming on. Uh, we're going to have right, to have guys. you back on again whenever those books come out. So till then. All right, that sounds great. And uh, well, thanks again for having me on the show. Uh, we covered a lot of ground, I think, tonight, didn't we, really? Absolutely. Yeah, I'm, <laughs> I'm glad you're safe. I'm glad you're you're washing your hands and staying locked up there in your, in your yeah. home, just churning out more books. <laughs> yeah, well, there's not much else I can do right now other than do exactly that. And we're back with Expanded Perspectives. Oh, man, Nick, man, he's always so much fun. I mean, do you know somebody that's more knowledgeable about the paranormal? I mean, you could sit there and rapid fire questions at him. He'd be like, oh, yeah, yeah, I know that. I mean, and it could be from anything from – I always feel like when we, we talk to him, whether it's in person and we hang out for hours, like we usually do an interview, <laughs> then we go to, in, go to dinner. Yeah. It's like I never get enough. Like there's so many things I want to ask him. And then when I'm the next day to three, while I'm driving around work, and I'm thinking, of, man, I should have asked him that. Like you, I yeah. kind of forget when I'm in his presence, and it's something about just his voice. He's like the David Attenborough, yes. of the paranormal. Yes, 
you know? I catch <laughs> myself not wanting to be a burden on him and not just, like we're all hanging out and having a few drinks, we're just cutting up like normal. But in the back of my mind, I'm with you. It's like I have about 30 things I want to ask him, but I'm like, dude, I'm not going to be that guy that just bombards Nick from start to stop. You know what I mean? And people do, like at conferences yeah. and stuff. He's like always well reserved. But how I mean, does he I mean, keep I mean, well up liked. with all of it? I mean, like you and I have a lot to keep up with, and I forget stuff on the reg. But like you just brought up, even off air, we we're talking to Nick before the show, talking to Nick. You can fire stuff at him, and he's like, "Oh yeah," and then he starts talking. I'm like, "How do you keep all that you've done straight? Like, how do you know all this stuff and keep it filed away? Like, I can't do that." And and he'll be writing books, multiple books, and multiple articles. At the same time, like, so he'll wake up in the morning, he might work on a book for like two hours and then take a break, drink some PG tips, then start working on a different book for two Mm -hmm. hours, then write an article, then take a break, write another article. I mean, like he, he is like a machine. Yes. Yeah. What is it? Because when we first got to hang out with him, which was at the beginning of the show, we got lucky and and running. Very, very beginning. Him and Lyle. That's the time we ate dinner with Lyle and Sandy, him and Lyle. And then of course, because we'd gone to see Ken. Over That's in right. Grapevine. And Nick was riding with Ken. So and we I think were all it was hanging out in Ken's there. newest book at the time, I think it was called Encounters with Flying yep, Humanoids. It was. That was it. Yeah. I remember That's that. That's when we went. But I remember, like you're talking about, talking to Nick and asking him, like, how do you do all this? And he was like, I have a structure. Like, it's not just willy nilly. Like, I get up at like 7, 7 15, and then he has his breakfast, he has his coffee, he gets everything going. And he's like an eight to five. He works like, like you said, two hours on this book, two hours on this, two hours on this article, two hours on this. I go back, recover all of this. And it's like that five days a week. He treats it just like you would get up and go to the office and and grinds. And it shows. And he's like at every conference, no matter yep, where it's at, yep, he's yep. at everything. He's, I mean, I hear him on different podcasts almost weekly or, you know, late night radio. I mean, like the guy is everywhere. He li- he's not just writing about it, dude. He lives it. Yeah. And that's why he... He's one of the best. I mean, it's just he has so much information. I love that dude. And he is such a genuinely kind human being. Right. Like I when I But first, he's a punk. Don't get me wrong, folks. He is one of those British 80s punk guys. That's how he grew up. Yeah. Like he is like Johnny Rotten Sex Pistols, all you can imagine, the clash. That's Nick. A hundred percent that's Nick. Yeah, yeah. I know. When I first met him, or the I, I was kind of nervous. I thought he was gonna be like, you know, uh, uh, this renowned uh, like author. a stuffy British fellow. That's what, what I, I thought expected. was right. And then you meet the yeah. guy and you're like, dude, this guy's like totally normal. Dude, he's so great. <laughs> yeah, uh, I'm with you. I was the exact same like, way. Oh, man. Well, it looks like they're about to lift, at least in the state of Texas, some of the the quarantine rules. And I'm not sure if that's a great idea yet, but it, I think that people are ready. Yeah. And so I expect in the next couple of days, like town is just going to be flooded with everybody just trying to get out. It was go crazy. to every store, even if you don't need nothing. I just want to go walk around the store because people just m- miss being able to do that. I left the house a little after seven this morning, and it was madness, like it was like normal hours, like nothing had been going on. And up until this point, it had been extremely like ghost town. Like you remember when this all first yeah, started, yeah. it was like nobody was in town, and now. It's like everybody's like, okay, you can go back. And everybody just starts going crazy. We just start, everybody starts freaking out and thinks and everything's like good to go again. We're supposed to start in Texas, May 1st. And I don't know if it's this way across the U.S., but I know it is here. May 1st, it's open. Uh, restaurants can open to 25% capacity, something. Like that, something. Yeah. And then by the 15th of May, they want to do 50%. They're trying to see, I guess, how much the cases jump. I will personally not be partaking in any of that. No, I won't I'm either. not going. I'm not changing what I do. I'm not going out. I'm not going to go hang out. I'm just. I will go to work and I will come home and I will, as like I told you at the start of the show, I will be doing remodels. What my wife tells me to do. <laughs> right. I'm not trying to. First of all, I text you today and told you we'll have to find it. You have to go get tested. Yeah, no, I want to. I just wanted to settle down because I'm. I don't want to go to the hospital where everybody's there. That are it has a case. Yeah. I don't. Yeah. Now I've become infected. Like I'm kind of waiting for it to blow over a little yeah. bit. I, dude, you had it. I believe I'm a hundred percent, hundred percent. I am too. It. Like I'd be like really shocked if it came back that I didn't have it. But because if you had it, 
then I'm going to go and see if I was exposed and have the antibodies. Yeah, maybe you did because they said not, you know, some people catch it and it just doesn't really. Yeah, I mean, I felt like crap a little bit on that trip, but I thought it was the trip, right? Yeah. You're just like, it is what it is. But while you were trying to keep from dying, I was down there just living my best life in NOLA, baby. Right. Well, don't forget, we're doing a live stream. Saturday, May 2nd, 4 p.m. Central Standard Time, mm -hmm. uh, like we talked about at the beginning of the show. On YouTube. Don't listen to me earlier. It's on on YouTube. YouTube. If you have any questions or you just want to join in and just look at our ugly mugs, just show up. It'll be awesome to have you there. Uh, we're going to be talking and shooting the breeze and, and just having a good old time. And like we've talked about before, if you really want to help out the show, go to YouTube, find our channel, and subscribe to it. Give it a like. Give it a thumbs up. Yep. It helps us out, man. Yep. Yep. You know, just like I was talking about the sailing videos, like somebody's researching or watching the paranormal. If this is a popular channel because you liked it, it's going to pop up in their feed and then they're going to get caught finding us, which is going to lead to everything. That really helps us. If you want extra episodes of Expanded Perspectives, don't forget about Expanded Perspectives Elite. Go to the website, expandedperspectives.com. Find the Elite tab. Click on that. Sign up. It's easy. It's $5 a month. Every month you get extra content and the entire back catalog, like 250 plus shows some more than 250 plus hours worth of entertainment and more shows just like this one if you like this show you're going to like that show same length same 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 way we do it exactly the same material everything like that in fact nick's going to be on the elite show too that's right yeah there's going to be a continuation <laughs> of this actual interview over there on elite so if yep. you want to hear the second half of that interview go over to elite uh if you have any stories of your own you'd like to share with us please send them in expanded perspectives at yahoo.com you can follow me and Cam on all forms of social media. Till next time, folks, be careful out there. Wash your hands. I'm Kyle. He's Cam. Peace, y'all.